Welcome back. Welcome back. We're back. Everyone tuning in on Hopin will notice yes. that you can submit questions during the forums in the forum stage chat and or in the computer will relay the questions to the presenters. After the forums, be sure to visit the expo where you can interact with live representatives from exhibitor booths, many of which are offering great giveaways and discounts. Our second Comfish Forum this morning is the brief overview of Westward Region Herring and Salmon Fisheries Management with Kevin Schauberg and Jeff Waddle. Kevin is the Westward Region Salmon and Herring Research Supervisor of Forecasting, Escapement, Goal Development, and Enhancement Programs. Kevin has over 20 years of experience with Pacific Salmon research in Alaska and has worked in various locations across the state. He has been in his role in Kodiak since 2015. Jeff is the Westward Region Salmon Management Management Supervisor. Jeff started with his partner as a volunteer working on the Buskin River Ware in 1991. Since then, he has worked with the department around the state in different capacities. He came back to the Westward region in 1998 and has been in his current position in Kodiak since 2010. Please join me in welcoming Kevin and Jeff. All right, can everybody see me and hear me? No, nobody can see me or hear me. We've got you, Kevin, you can go ahead. Okay, all right, I'm just gonna pop up my presentation here and hopefully everybody can see it. It's going slow. There we go. Hopefully you guys are seeing full screen of my presentation. Um, well, first off, good morning and, and thanks Sarah for the introduction. Um, as Sarah mentioned, my name is Kevin Schaberg. And this morning I'll give a quick overview of herring and salmon forecasts across the Westward region and an update on planned research projects uh, for this upcoming year. Uh, since the next fishery in the region will likely be the herring fishery, I figured I would start with herring. So for 2021 herring, we have uh, the largest guideline harvest level in the last 40 years. Um, so things are looking pretty promising for herring. That large GHL is based on a large biomass that was observed last season in 2020. And that the target age class, those five to six year old herring that make up the, the better for the, the sack row fish um, are making up a larger part of that observed bio biomass as they get older and become part of that harvestable uh, fishery. Um, there were also 23,000 metric tons of herring observed in an overwinter ag aggregation in Raspberry Strait. Uh, we went out with uh, one of the research vessels and did hy hydroacoustic surveys and confirmed a lot of people's observations that there were a ton of herring in Raspberry Straits this winter. So those two things combined really give us some pretty decent confidence that the the fish that we're estimating to be available for har harvest um, are actually going to be there since this is the largest one we need some additional information to support that and so the total ghl for the 2021 herring sacro fishery is 7895 metric tons so uh, should be a good season for herring fishing so i'm going to now move into salmon forecasts and we're going to start in chignik um, Chignik sockeye salmon are expected to again be at low levels this year. Uh, the forecast for 2021 early run sockeye salmon is 437,000, which is about 65,000 less than last year's forecast. And as we know, that last year's forecast was much larger than the actual run returned. Um, and so we, we do believe that that might happen again this year, but because of the low returns that we've seen in the last few years and continued variability and ocean conditions. Um, we, we don't really have anything extra to add to it other than we have a forecast, but we do expect it to be a little optimistic. The late run forecast is 438,000, which is again, lower than last year's forecast. Um, and the, the total 
estimated harvest at this point is 165,000 sockeye salmon in Chignik, but we'll have to wait and see how the run progresses in season to see if that can be realized. Moving on to salmon on the Alaska Peninsula, uh, Nelson River sockeye salmon is forecast to be 333,000, which is a little bit less than last year. And then the late run Bear Lake forecast of 363,000 is a bit less than last year as well. So probably on par with last year, maybe a little bit less for Nelson and Bear. Um, on a brighter note, the pink salmon forecast for the South Alaska Peninsula is expected to be 16.9 million fish. Um, and that is an, an excellent forecast for the odd year pink salmon fishery in the Alaska Peninsula. Now we'll move into the Kodiak management area. The Spirit in Lake and Telrod Cove runs produced through enhancement efforts by Kodiak Regional Aquaculture Association are expected to provide a total harvest of 177,000 fish, which is a little bit more than, than what was estimated last year. Then we move down to Iaculik. This is forecast to have a run of 801,000 fish this year, which is about double what the forecast was last year. Um, and this is one of the few runs in the region that is expected to have a significant increase in abundance this year. The Carlick early run forecast is about 192,000 fish, which is a little bit less than last year's forecast, but about the same size as what the actual run last year was. Um, and then the late run forecast is 739,000, which is about 100,000 less than the forecast last year, but is more on par with what the actual run size looked like. So um, we, we do have some confidence that the Carlick total return will come in close to that 931,000 fish this coming year. Um, upper station early run sockeye salmon are forecast to be about 70,000 fish. Um, the late run forecast is 306,000 fish. Um, the overall upper, upper station run um, is probably going to be a little bit less than, than last year uh, with a little bit hopefully more fish in the, in the late run uh, showing up this year. And switching to Dog Salmon Creek, Fraser Lake, uh, the forecast is about 190,000, which is significantly less than, than what the forecast was last year. Um, so overall in the Alatac area, we do expect to see a, a slight reduction to the number of fish that are, that are coming back this year. And then the Kodiak pink salmon forecast, is a combination of wild stocks and Katoy Bay hatchery fish. The wild stocks expected to contribute 11.6 million fish to the region-wide harvest, and Katoy Bay is expected to produce an additional 10.9 million fish for a total forecasted harvest of 22.5 million fish. And this is a, a pretty strong run for an odd year in the KMA. Now I'll uh, move on to a quick update on planned research activities for 2021. We plan on operating all escapement monitoring projects similar to last year at Fraser Fish Pass, Sultry Creek, Sag Jack River, Fognac River, as well as Carlock, Iaculuk, Upper Station, Dog Salmon Creek, Nelson River, Bear Lake, Chignik River, Orzinski Lake, and McLeese Lake. So we're going to be um, up there and monitoring escapement at all those projects this year as usual. We'll also monitor harvest through catch sampling efforts based at shoreside plants and on the water in some select sections. And we'll also keep an eye on, on fish ticket reporting. We've been uh, moving down to the next zone repair and design of fish passes. We've been working on repairing fish passes. Um, most of them are on a fog neck island. Uh, some of these like the ladders at Waterfall Creek need a mixture of some minor repairs and some significant repairs in some at uh, like Laura Creek is an example where that uh, the, the system that we have for in Laura Creek has degraded. It basically blew out. It wasn't holding water and letting fish pass up there. And so we have done a temporary fix on that system, but knowing that we need to have a long-term fix, we've uh, contracted an engineering firm to uh, survey and design the most cost-effective and operationally effective repairs there. 
Um, this has been done in cooperation with KRA who provided funds for materials to do repairs and as well as splitting some costs with, with the survey work and also su supplying the materials that we need to do some work at the waterfall projects this year. So the next project that we have planned for this year, a new one is we'll be testing a video counting system at Fraser Fish Pass. It's been noted over the years that fish will at times build up below the fish pass, and that has been attributed by some folks to be a result of the fact that we close the top of the fish ladder when we're not counting fish, um, so that we can make sure that we count all the fish. Um, this project hopefully will allow us to evaluate if we can produce timely and accurate counts of fish using the video system, um, and hopefully allow us to be able to operate and leave the, the fish pass open 24 hours a day and use video to count those fish in the future. But this is first year of the project, so we'll test it out for a few years and see how, how accurate those numbers can be um, as we move forward. Um, we're also hoping to cooperate in a nearshore juvenile fish survey across the region, looking for juvenile pink salmon as they enter the ocean. This would entail contracting out a vessel to survey a total of 14 bays six in Kodiak, four in Chignik, and four in South Peninsula, with each bay um, having five to six established Saint beach seine locations. We expect this survey to provide additional information on juvenile pink salmon health conditions as they enter the ocean and live there for its early life history, and possibly to get estimates of, of relative abundance for, for particular stocks which in both of those things can provide more information to forecasts and hopefully make those forecasts precise. And this is a, a proposal that we have on the table for a last little bit of the 20, 2016 Gulf of Alaska pink salmon disaster funds. Speaking of disaster funds, we're also anticipating developing project proposals for the 2018 Chignik sockeye salmon disaster. Um, the timeline for this is to probably start field work in 2020 at the earliest. Um, uh, there were some updates from uh, legislatures and folks yesterday, I think, that, that spoke to this a little bit. The, the spending plan is still yet to be fully approved, I think, um, in, in Washington. And as soon as that comes back, we should be able to start submitting our, our project proposals to those. Um, two of the projects that the department will be proposing is a uh, hydroacoustic surveys in Chignik Lake to assess habitat use, relative densities of fish and seasonal movement patterns of salmon fry and smolt throughout the drainage. And then we'll also be submitting a proposal to look at the whole watershed for lake conditions, uh, plankton composition, plankton abundance, temperatures, oxygen levels, and other biochemical indicators that we sample in the lakes, as well as evaluating juvenile sockeye salmon diets, health condition, movement patterns, and habitat use throughout the season. So that is the end of my section. I don't know, Sarah, if we want to move right into Jeff or if we would like to take questions at this time. I don't currently see any questions. So just as a reminder to all attendees, if you have questions for our presenters, you can go ahead and enter those into the chat or the Q&A area. So while we wait for any of those questions, I think we can go ahead and let Jeff begin his presentation. All right, let me... See if I can get this back to share on the screen here. Are you seeing the presentation pop up? Not yet. Not yet. All right. Trying to. We've got it now. All right. Okay, I'll just jump right into it. Um, good morning. My name is Jeff Wadley. I'm the regional salmon and herring biologist for the West region, which includes Kodiak and Chignik areas, the uh, North and South Peninsula of Area M and the Aleutian Islands Management Area. 
Uh, Kevin has gone through the expectations for harvest and ex escapement in those areas, so I would like to focus more on the budgetary aspects of the management plans and talk about a few of the most recent changes to regulations within salmon and herring management. With those changes, I am going to discuss how they impact our regional budget and how we are maintaining our mission of conservation and maximizing opportunity for commercial salmon and herring permit holders. <clears throat> But first, I will mention that as of now, the Board of Fisheries will not be meeting this next winter for the Chignik and Airy M meetings. Essentially, they're going to hold off for a year. Um, also, for the region, we're deploying all weirs um, that were deployed in 2020. We have reduced staff in order to do so, and I will discuss that more later. Uh, I would like to mention a couple of biologists that took new positions within the last year. In the Chignik management area, we have, we have uh, Reed Johnson as the new area management biologist. Uh, we also have Charlie Russell coming back to the region as the new assistant to North Peninsula. And finally, finally in the South Peninsula, we have Ross Rennick taking on the assistant area management biologist position in Sand Point. Now to my main discussion. Um, so changes in management strategies can obviously have an impact on allocations between user groups within areas and between areas and it can impact fish populations. However, one aspect that can be overlooked is the department's budget. While the board does try to take into account costs due to regulatory changes is generally the budgetary aspects that are overlooked and can have substantial impacts to how management proceeds in any, any given season. And so I am also going to talk about the changes that have impacted our budgets within the Kodiak area because it was the most recent salmon and herring board of fisheries meeting for the Western region. However, as a region, any budgetary impacts within any given area does impact across all areas of the Western region and even impacts across the management of other species such as shellfish and groundfish. And it also impacts our ability to conduct uh, research projects. So in the Kodiak area, during the January 2020 Board of Fisheries meeting in Kodiak, there were several major changes that affected the management of salmon and herring. And first of all, I'm going to talk about the herring sack row. This slide has a summary of the changes to the herring sack row management plan. Uh, the one change that has had the biggest budgetary impact was the season date change from April 15th to April 1st. <clears throat> The change to the season date obviously required the department to manage the fishery earlier. Now for herring, we have used the research vessels KIC and the resolution. We also use aerial surveys and field camps for management. However, with the change of the opening date for the 2020 season and the upcoming 2021 season, we have had to deploy the KIC two weeks earlier than normal. This, of course, increased our costs and we had no commensurate increase to our budget. In order for us to continue our on the grounds management, we chose to increase our time on the KIC. And to do that, we needed to discontinue the East Side Field Camp. And we are relying more on our cost recovery program. And I'll talk more about that later. <clears throat> we did not extend the time of deployment for the resolution. And that again has to do with shortfalls in the budget. So essentially for the first two weeks of the fishery, we have the KIC with support from our region's aircraft as our sole platform for on the grounds management. Potential impacts of this change could have been to only open areas that are observ observable and thus directly manageable by the department or permit holders that could have meant a loss of harvest opportunity. However, for this season, the department is going to open all sections at the beginning of the season. In order for this to succeed, the department will rely on the permit holders and processors to immediately report harvest in those areas the department is not able to directly observe. This does carry a risk of over harvest to the biomass and if harvests are not immediately reported, if that becomes prevalent, the department will shut down sections and reopen only those areas that can be managed on the grounds. Now I'm gonna go on to salmon. There were also several changes to the salmon management plans in the Kodiak area, including those plans listed on the slide. But again, I'll keep the discussion to those changes that have had the most impact to the budgets. One of the biggest changes was the North Shelikoff Sockeye Salmon Management Plan. Very briefly, the North Shelikoff Plan was implemented by the Board of Fisheries to prevent an expanding fishery beginning in the late 80s in the North Shelikoff sections of Kodiak. You can read more about that in our annual management reports and also within the Kodiak Area Regulation Booklets. 
Basically, the plan has a sockeye salmon harvest trigger that when met, the department then closes portions of the sections associated with this plan and defined as outside waters, which can be seen in our annual reports and harvest strategies. The changes to the North Shellcock plan include adding the Katmai and Alinchak Bay sections to the plan. The timing of the plan was increased from the original time frame of July 6th through July 25th to now from July 6th through August 1st. The trigger was originally 15,000 sockeye and was increased to 20,000 sockeye. And the Cape IGVAC section was added from July 6th to August 1st. And that section has its own trigger of 20,000 sockeye salmon, which once achieved will close a portion of the Cape IGVAC section as defined in regulation. And just to kind of show you the impacts of that, here's a map showing the increase in area on the mainland portion of the North Shellcock plan. The chart on the left shows the previous area and the chart on the right shows the expansion of the plan. As you can see, it basically doubles the area now managed under the North Shellcock plan. This slide summarizes the impacts of both how we manage and the effects to the program. In order for the department to monitor the harvest and implement the sockeye trigger, we deploy the KIC to monitor the fisheries in those sections. Once the department determines 20,000 sockeye will be harvested, an emergency order is announced closing those portions of the mainland district. With those increases in time and area, the KIC mo monitors a much larger area while staying out for a longer period of time. Again, this is an increase to our cost with no commensurate increase to our budget. While there are more examples, I will stop with those two and go on to how the department has been trying to weather those increases and is currently maintaining our ability to manage those fisheries. We have had to decrease our staff by three technicians in 2021, and we are also bringing some seasonal staff on later. Of course, when you take those actions and in order to maintain current management, other staff must take up those duties and unfortunately, they are already fully allocated, so it can be difficult to find staff time. While we are maintaining our ability to manage, it does require us to manage more conservatively in some areas, in some cases. <clears throat> Another avenue the department is using to continue to manage, uh, to continue management are our test fish programs. Originally, these test, fish, test fisheries were used for information gathering and management. They are an important tool to the managers to assess abundance and migration patterns. These test fisheries are typically a bid process and fishermen that participate are compensated for their efforts. Depending on the bid language, there are different processes between areas and I won't get into the details. Um, and the department typically uses excess funds um, from those test fisheries to pay for expenses accrued by the test fishery programs. <clears throat> However, the department is increasing and relying on those test fish programs and the funds generated are now used as a cost recovery tool as well. The amount of funds that can be used is dependent on how much authority the state legislature will assign to the department. In recent years, the test fishery have become important cost recovery programs that are helping fund our management activities. Also, more and more of the revenue is used to help fund field technicians, pilots, permanent full-time biologists, and vessel captains. One very important aspect of the test fishery is that the department has been able to carry forward these funds between fiscal years. So in years when the test fishery budget was not entirely used, it would be available the next fiscal year. That has been invaluable to the management programs as it tends to compensate for low abundance years within areas and between areas. And by that, I mean, if a cost recovery fishery could not take place due to low abundance, there would still be enough generated funds to spend on the available authority as long as the funds could be carried forward. It also allows for years when the programs are more costly. For example, on the Carlick River, on big pink years, more staff and staff time are needed to maintain the weir and count salmon than on smaller pink years. <clears throat> the carry forward allows the department to compensate for more costly years and in turn save, mon save funds when not needed. It also allows managers to carry the money forward when the cost recovery fishery takes place in late in the fiscal year. For example, the SACRO cost recovery occurs in April and May uh, of the current fiscal year. The funds then carry forward and are used in the next hearing season in the next fiscal year. So to wrap up, staff are continuing to find ways to fund our salmon and herring management programs in the Western region. Um, sorry, I missed that. And however, it has been a challenge and it is becoming more difficult. There are recent changes within a bid process that are becoming more difficult to navigate, mostly due to changes to the department's budgetary oversight. 
We have also seen our salmon and herring test fish authority become fully allocated in the management programs. This obviously no longer allows for increased revenue needs on big pink years. In order to increase our budgets using the test fishery or cost recovery programs, we will need to see our spending authority increased as allocated by the state legislature. We will continue to look for ways to work within our budgets and look for uh, other sources of funding as well. And with that, our, we can take questions. We've got just a couple minutes for questions. I've not seen anything come in, but definitely uh, many people extending their thanks to both of you for such uh, interesting and thorough presentations. So we'll go ahead and give it just another minute for any attendees that might have questions. You can go ahead and submit those in the chat or under the QA portion of the forum stage. And uh, we will we will wait just a minute for those to come in. But thank you so much, both Kevin and and Jeff. Those really were fantastic. That's it's a lot of information to absorb. Glad we could be helpful. Okay, I'm not seeing anything right now, but if you guys are willing, could you share uh, some of your contact information so that if they do come up with a question, um, whether they're watching a recorded version of this presentation or just didn't get a chance to ask, they can reach out to you. Sure. Um, I can be reached at kevin.shaberg at alaska.gov anytime. Just shoot me an email. Uh, and my phone number is 907-486. 1873 here in the office. And you can reach me at jeff.wadley, W A D L E, uh, at alaska.gov. And my phone number is 907 486 1813. Okay. And we have had a question come in while we were waiting, which is how long has the near shore salmon work been going? Is it envisioned that it will be permanent? That's a good question. Um, the the contractor that we're considering uh, using to do this has been conducting this for three years, I believe, already outside of uh, department involvement. Um, it's focused on juvenile Pacific cod um, initially, and the researchers were sharing the data and information with us here at the department, and we started to see that there was some utility in that because they were capturing a lot of juvenile pinks as well. Um, we're hopeful that our current ask for money um, provides about four to five years of this program, um, which at that point will provide a good, you know, seven, eight, nine year data set um, to evaluate its utility and um, understanding pink salmon and, and how it can be used to forecast pink salmon returns. So not permanent, um, like Jeff mentioned, we don't have a lot of permanent right now. <laughs> we have to find avenues to uh, find cooperators, um, search out money through grants and other opportunities and um, do the best we can. And this is a good opportunity. And you know the, the researchers were sharing this information beforehand and we saw the utility. So we, we thought that we'd give it a shot to fund them to continue that research. Absolutely. Well, we are coming up on the last minute here of our presentation. So I know you guys have been extremely busy and I just want to take the time to say thank you so much for taking the time out for us and sharing such important information. No problem. No problem. Thank you, Sarah. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. All right. We're back. I know that uh, my video cut out there on the last presentation, so hopefully you're seeing it. But if not, uh, we will be back so soon, just, just a few minutes here at 1130 with a presentation from Josh Keaton about innovation and electronic monitoring. Of course, the presentation you just heard and the rest you will hear today wouldn't have been possible without the generosity of our sponsors, which are listed just below this presentation. So we will see you back at 1130. Thanks so much. <laughs>